works right now just just to get the comments okay okay so anyways uh we had a two we had a multiple way uh conversation uh on a couple of subjects and one of them was the demographics of amateur astronomy and uh i've been in communication with Richard Berry. Actually, I, I got the idea for the subject uh, uh, from one of his Facebook comments uh, about that. And uh, basically, he, um, the title of his, of his thing was Ast Amateur Astronomy, an Old White, white Man's uh, Hobby. And uh, so they had some interesting um, uh, graphs on there about the demographics of uh, most of amateur astronomy now is in the uh, 50 to 60 uh, year percentile and 90% uh, are men um, and uh, like 90% are white. And so I had a discussion with him. He says, you know, Mike, people had the same discussions about this in the early 50s, uh, where they, it, it, the demographics were exactly the same. But if you go back to the original amateur making telescope books by Ingalls, okay, and you go through the pages, okay, of who built telescopes, um, the people were a lot younger and things were a lot more mixed. For example, um, the first part of the book is actually a reprint of Reverend Ellison's uh, telescope making. And he was a, a priest in South America and was making amateur telescopes. And uh, the, um, while there were no African-Americans in any of the real pages, in there, there was a pretty mixed group of different anesthet I'm, I'm getting, you know, uh, people from all walks of life, okay, including young women and uh, old people, rich and poor and all that during the 1920s and 1930s. And for two reasons, one was that you couldn't buy a telescope of decent size, unless you were an organization like uh, a college or a professional observatory. So um, people started making their own telescopes because they, they couldn't get a telescope any other way. And, and they built it. And that's how Engels, um, you know, with his articles in Scientific Americans got his start and uh, continued on with that. And especially in the 1930s where um, you had a, you know, economic uh, upheaval, people made their own telescopes. It wasn't until I believe um, probably around the mid fifties when you had a bunch of amateurs turned professional telescope makers um, selling them. You know, we're talking about the cave and the optical craftsman and some of the other ones. Yeah, people bought Unitron, but um, when it came down to large telescopes, which were mostly reflectors, okay, it was basically people coming up the ranks from amateur to professionals and amateurs making telescopes. And you could see, you know, all through the 20s and 30s and, and on how, you know, they have some very sophisticated scopes that they built. Okay, now some of them, like I remember this one guy had this, uh, built this Cassegrain where it was on a, a um, horseshoe mount. Was, I think it was like 20 inches or 16 inches. And he observed from a pit that he dug out on the ground, okay? And that guy was in Pasadena and he was a doctor, but there were other people that basically were a mirror on a stick, so to speak. And they had pictures of those. Those obviously were people of no large economic means. If you take a look at the houses that they lived in, the pictures they were taken with. So, um, 
So in the 20s and 30s, possibly the 40s, you know, it was amateur astronomers were a larger mixed bag than they tend to be now. Now, it's not to say that there isn't a large amount of people that are buying telescopes and, 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 and other things that aren't in their 30s and 40s, uh, but they're, they tend to be far and few between. And um, if, if you remember during the dot-com boom, you know, a lot of people got very rich, you know, young engineers and stuff like that. And they'd go in, in the shops and buy a ton of stuff, whether they used it or not. That's, that's another thing. But I remember uh, talking with some of the uh, different stores where we go, yeah, you know, we got cleaned out by these dot-com guys. They had money, they came in and they bought and they left, you know. Um, so the, the thing is, is that, um, I, th I think as far as amateur astronomy, I mean, most clubs and, and people in it are, tend to be concerned that it tends to be uh, a hobby that's habituated by older people with a lot of expendable money. And uh, I, I think now we're trying to, and I know your club is, and you know I try and do it when I can, outreach and make people more cognizant of astronomy, try and make it more enjoyable and get people to be excited to get into the hobby. So, uh, and, and not just old people, um, but young people. I think that's very important. I, I remember when I went to Polaris Astronomical Society when I was a kid and it was, we're talking about early 60s, mid 60s. Um, it was a lot of a lot of people that were a lot younger than they are now. We're talking about people in their 20s and 30s. And so, um, and, and kids. Um, anyways, that was one of the talk. And we, we had this back and forth and it, it worked out really well when you have your audio set up that everybody can be heard on both sides of the, uh, the internet, so to speak. And so, so what did you one, have for a microphone that picked up everybody that was with you, the five people there? That's so the people. Well, the four I've been people? using the laptop, but I started using this, the little lavalier oh. mic. Okay. And it picked up, you put, just put it in the middle of your group and it picked everybody yeah. up. Yeah, we had, yeah, um, I put it actually oh, about eight feet away from me in, in the middle of everybody. Um, there wasn't that many people, but it, it picked it up. And as you know, even when you're presenting on, uh, on you're sharing the screen, you have the opportunity to have other people, um, other people's faces to the side, so to speak to be on there so it's not you're not just talking into nothingness you can see the people that you're talking to and i think if i had my druthers i would have a dual screen type of situation mm -hmm. where i would have the screen for the people being shown and then the screen for the share screen you know because uh I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm fiddling with the with the mouse here. You know, do I, I want to see everything, or do I want to see everybody's face and reaction, see who I'm talking to, or you know, it's it's. Yeah, I haven't seen that where you have that dual screen for Zoom. I'm not sure. There must be a way that that gets set up. Well, I'm I'm sure what you can do is like on this laptop, I could have um, different modes where I can have dual screen, different, or make them part of one large screen where I could move off that little section of people in this in the share screen over to the side, I believe. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. I'd have to uh, look into that. You know what I think would be the best thing to do would be to open up two streams. So in other words, two sessions, in other words. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah you could do good. that. But yeah. yeah. Now, whether you could have those on the same machine, I don't know. 
that's yeah, the have, question. I'll have to I'll have to try that. Um, if you had two streams, and I mean, people at home would have to have two screens as well, two separate uh, connections to Zoom. Well, the, the other simple think. thing is just to have a, another laptop, um, open up another laptop yeah. and another uh, have it there. Another yeah. session, because Hink, Hink does that, remember? he's He has two sessions going, so. Who? Hink. Oh, Hink he Ling, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he does too. I've seen him do it. But he's logging in into our our you know main group that I've started right. I've got the, the yeah. Main I would Zoom think link. he would have to log in tw uh, twice. He would yeah he, have to, yeah for he, each he machine does. Machine. But it's to the to the same Zoom connection. But if right. I do a uh, do if I do a share screen, then both of his connections would show that share screen. He wouldn't see people on one and and presentation on the other. So it That's has to be two tough. two separate Zoom connections, and everybody would have to have two separate the laptops to see what's if going on. If they wanted to let's, see the same thing, let's, yeah. Let's let's do a, a little experiment here, okay? It's just us, right. us uh, people here. You want to share? Um, I'm, I'm, let's try a, whoops. No, hold a second here. Okay, I'm going to put, I'm going to display settings. I'm going to and say you're going, going to be going limited to, on to this. one session per device is what I'm going to say. But anyway, I could be well, Okay, I'm going to do, a... I'm, I'm doing an extend display now. Okay. Okay, keep changes. I mean, with Zoom, you log in with one name. You'd have to have two accounts. Yeah, you couldn't do it. Okay, I'm doing, a, I'm, I'm doing a share screen, okay? So what I'm going to do is just share this one. Okay. And we're not going to the side. It works. It works. What uh, what you're seeing um what you're seeing is probably the second screen that I have up, but I can see you guys on the screen on the laptop. So, so Oh, okay. So you separate it, You've separated the presentation from the people. Yep. Because what I have is I I have you know just three three boxes of us at the top of your in your presentation down yeah. below. Okay, on one hold a second. Let, let me just do a share. Let me let me just bring up something. Here. So I mean, you being the presenter, I mean, I could I could share a screen, Mike, and you'll see what I'm talking about. So okay. if I share uh, this information over here in Cloudy Nights or something talking about demographics, how many people are here. So I've shared a screen. I see three boxes on the right here. That's okay, and um, let's see I here. Could, if I, I could, could move, move the share ah. screen off to one side. Okay, I, I, can see, I can see you guys on one screen and uh, the other thing on the other. Okay. So it, it can work. So if you've got two screens. Right, uh, so you got to have it set up for two screens, okay. So in other words, you've got two monitors, right? I have the laptop and I have the share screen. I mean the other the other screen, so it's working. But hmm. but Mike, I, are you seeing the the full size uh, pictures of the people, like just like we had it before? I shared the screen. Yeah, you know, uh, we were... on my laptop, which is smaller. Yeah, just little small boxes, right? No, well, I mean, I like have... some like thumbnails of our big pictures. Um, no, no, I've got to, I've got to filling up the entire screen of my laptop. Gotcha. Really? Yeah. So presentation on the second screen and uh, yeah. people on the other screen. So yeah. how did you do that? Well, I just made it in one big extended screen. Now, let me go to the uh, view here. Like an extended. And do exit full desktop. screen. And now I'm going to put it on my laptop. And then what I'm going to try and do is, oh, that's interesting. Um, so it works. It it works out better. Okay, let me tell you. Um, for whatever reason, oh, I can't do this now. Why is this view full screen? Okay. Oh, that's weird. Okay. What I'm doing is going exiting full screen. 
moving this over to the laptop and I'm trying to. Well, okay. Okay. Now he's still got, he's still sharing. Tom is still sharing his, is that hurting you? Okay. Small oh, I can, I can do it either way. I can do it either way. I can, um, I can swap. Okay, so wherever you have it on, whatever screen you have it on, laptop or the other one, okay, you you uh, you put it on full screen on that one monitor from smaller, and then you can drag the people over back and forth. I, I yeah. see. On, on what I'm doing right now, I've discovered is that up in the um, on my screen, I have uh, you know I have my pre my presentation window in the middle uh -huh. of my screen and then i've got you three three of us on the side and thumbnails right right but and the the choice over there for the thumbnails there's four choices one is yeah, to hide you, the thumbnails yeah but the you second... but the but the the fact that you have people there it's take drag it, it it's basically uh, a square with with everything in there with the uh with 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 the little icons you can drag that to the other screen right I'm, that's what i'm trying to get to is that well, there's four choices for that window of the thumbnails of people right. and, the, and the last one shows like nine little squares that, and i've got that and, on there and that one on that one you can actually resize the the pictures right of us. and so and, and it's and, actually it's actually a small box that you can move around and yeah. you can move it to the and you can drag it to the other screen Right. That's right. what I did. So, so I, I, I so basically what it is um, is wherever you want to sh to see the main share, you put it on that screen and then you drag everybody to the other screen. Right. Right. That's, that's, okay. That's, that's not, good to know. That's, that's, I mean, that's, because yeah. I had not tried that before. Yeah. Well. It, try something new. So anyways, that's, I'm glad that that happened. So I'm going to exit. Good, good to talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, even though it's not germane to telescope making, it certainly is germane to what goes on in this club, how we present things to other people. So one of the things I wanted to tell Jerry was that I got my new laser in for my, um, Oh, yeah, interferometer. Interferometer. And um, it seems to have a much better beam. And the, the important thing, at least with this one, he, uh, the guy put on a variable resistor that allows me to adjust the intensity of the uh, interferometer, which is helpful. Here's, in many here's ways. Jerry coming in right now, Mike. Okay. So share screen and uh, see. Hey Jerry, I uh, I got my inter I got my new laser in uh, for the interferometer. Does it have one spot or two? Has one spot. Okay. Okay, and I got the I got the better one. There's ones for like thirteen dollars, and the other ones like twenty nine dollars. I got the twenty nine dollar uh -huh. one with a a good lens on there. It seems to give a a pretty good beam. Um, and um, mine came with a variable resistor. And so you can change the intensity. Uh, but th the thing is, is that you could, you basically, you could turn down the intensity when you plug it and unplug it so that you can protect the laser from transients. Mm -hmm. And I, I have a feeling what I'm gonna do is go inside there and put two things on there. Uh, one would be a capacitor, okay, that would keep transients from going through and, you know, upsetting the laser. And the other would be what they call a Zener diode um, that would keep the voltage below a certain level, mm -hmm. no matter what. Um, so you think you burned out the other one? Yeah. Well, we discussed it. Yeah. It, um, some of the less expensive uh, five volt supplies, you know, that they use for charging. Yeah. They're not very well regulated, you know, 
Yeah. And he was telling me that he'd seen it where if you just plug it in, it generates transients, a momentary short, and it goes, the voltage goes down, whoops, and then it goes up to compensate and then goes down again, does that type of thing till the, the loop of the power supply settles out. So that's one thing to be careful about. So uh -huh. I haven't had a chance to get a, um, a, a decent um, interferometer, uh, interfer interferogram, but uh, uh, maybe okay. tomorrow or the day after. Mm -hmm. So you, did, thing, you buy, did you buy the laser from here on this website? GR5. Yeah, I think you just passed the laser price list. Oh, I don't see it. Oh, no, that's the lenses. Oh, hold a second. Oh, there, there's, some, there's a $2 five milliwatt red laser. Must be, must be listed somewhere else. Okay. Yeah, it has a master list somewhere. Video software, discussion group. Um, materials the one thing about his website it's you can't it some things are hidden you know um a lot of websites are lit up yeah it you can't you can't oh that's a video i didn't want that no. i didn't want the video sorry go back two 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 it's a little bit Yeah. yeah, on this one, he did, you can't get to his his uh, his store. Assembly instructions. No, I just. I just uh, don't see it there. It's cute. His dog's looking at him as he constructs uh -huh. this. <laughs> yeah. And every so often, he gives him a cookie. No wonder he's looking at him. Yeah, well, yeah, there's something. <laughs> what's in it for me? Yeah. Um, but uh, I think um, I can't see the um, where it's pointing at, uh, but there's definitely. Okay, we got Heather coming in here. We're going to oh, have to help her oh, choose a telescope. The GR5 store. That's what you need to be. Uh, it's a gr5.org slash store, maybe? No, no, the. The. Put the okay. in the beginning. In the beginning. Let me try a new tab here. Hi, Heather. GR5 store. If I just do that, search should come up. There it is. Is that it, Mike? Well, yeah, he does other things. Now go in the search and do lasers. Spare parts. No, you just do search, search. laser. No results from that one. Oh, God. <laughs> you know, that, that's, the, that's the, let's help. Oh, this, uh, one, this might Heather. be the wrong store. No, no. He does, uh, the interferometers are a side job for his main thing which is selling stuff for um 3d printers you know uh -huh. everything he sells uh, the the interferometers may, is a 3d printed product let's see here's the home page oh go back go back to where you be, were before to the search here yeah the search go down 150 gr5s that one try that so, well that's the same one that's where oh, we no. were Okay, I will find it. Let's <laughs> let's help Heather and. Uh, no worries. Yeah. Okay. So Heather, did you make a decision on which telescope you want to get? Can you hear us? Oh, your your microphone is off. Oh, I no, I didn't yet. But I just wanted to say thank you so much for all your patience because there was so much back and forth. You guys had so many good ideas and tips on what things to look for and what scopes to check out. Thank you. I did 
get one for the kids just to mess around with. Like it's really cheap. I got a $160 um, equatorial mount 80 millimeter uh, refractor. Um, it's not EQ, so it's going to have like distortion and it's, mm -hmm. um, it's just that, it's that Orion, that Orion 80 millimeter. Yeah. Just, just so they, I mean, my kid Ariel, she, she jumped on my computer today on accident. So I'm just, <laughs> I want one that they can, <laughs> they can use, you know, too. Um, it's a, it's amazing how someone can accidentally jump on your computer, but it can happen. So I definitely want like one telescope that they can, and I like this equatorial mount Orion one because they can still really practice, you know, correctly using the celestial um, coordinates and, um, you know, have, right and then they, right once ascension. they find an object, they can track it a little easier by hand. You know, have, having it on that mount. So I, I like that setup for them. I still want a nice one, you know? I still would love a nice one. Well, those, uh, those what, five-inch Mac, Mac, Mac Sutoffs are compact. They're heavy, like Jerry says, especially the bigger ones in the front. Uh, but they're very compact. And they're like, you know, like an eight-inch you know, SCT from Celestron. It is only like 20 pounds. You can get the six-inch size. It's more limiting. And right. then your mount. You have to have a mount that's, you know, chunk of metal with uh, weights to balance that out. Right. So right. It, it does start right. adding up all the weight. Those are, and, those are slow systems and narrow fields of view. I right. think when you're starting out looking for objects, you want to have a wider field of view. I agree with you. When but you Jerry, you like know. you suggested, you could put on a, that F6.3, uh, what's that called? A focal field reducer. Presser, photo reducer, right. But that doesn't reducing. make the field of view any wider. It just it just makes a smaller picture. Just makes uh, a smaller picture. Doesn't it give yeah, you a wider but, field of view? No, I don't think so. Yeah. The um, field of view is defined by all those the light baffles that come down, and and those don't change when you um, concentrate the image. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Got me there. Yeah. So so Heather's looking for you know a, a beginning telescope, but with some quality to it, perhaps. Yeah. That, and that uh, keep the kids uh, looking for wide field images, or you know, looking at planets too. We're um we're using that book that you guys told us about the astronomical discoveries you can make yourself. Uh huh. It's a great book. I love it. Yeah. It's really good. Well, for kids, I think, you know, you want to get them something. They don't really care about a lot of the features that we're talking about. They just want something easy to look through and easy to use and that does make an image. Right. My, first, my first telescope was a spotting scope that was either 30 or 40 millimeter diameter. And it was 30 power. And just learning how to what focusing meant and things like that. It was, by, it was by Monolux, was the maker of it. Yeah. Um, my friends and I, when we were about eight or ten, we, we would camp out in the backyard in our sleeping bags, and we'd have the telescope right above us because it was a straight-through looking thing. And we'd just look and see different stars trying to figure out what's going on. Isn't so that fun? A lot of questions. Yeah, it was. Yikes, I got a lot of pages here. It's a great book. I, I really like that book. It was hard to get other parents to, like agree to do this book with us. Um, I recommended it to a lot of families and only one other family out of everyone I recommended to like was excited to do it with us. They thought it was too intense. Oh. You saw that other book that I advertise on the, um, the notice of these meetings. There's one by uh, Aurora Lipper up in San Luis Obispo and she, made her book and that's probably not a bad book to look at for do you like it going. as much as this other one i don't think it's as intense probably not i, I, I have like this one. Book. Oh, I, I have yeah i've got it right here yeah that's the one she made activity book and let's see what's the table of contents say it I says like ages the intense one. 
Yeah. It says ages five through seven on this one, but I, it looked it was interesting to me for me to look through it. It was kind of bringing up a lot of different subjects. This is the uh, one you guys gave us that that telescope. That's that was from you guys. That looks like a reflector. Yeah. It is okay, and it looks like about a four and a quarter inch reflector, about f ten. It is Pro probably yeah. Okay. I like it. It's yeah, nice. It works. I mean, the, the kids. It, it's just. Um, it's really nice. It's the, they could see they could see the rings on Saturn for years. Yeah. They've been looking at Jupiter's moons. It's it's been like yeah. a fun. It's good for it's, planets and the moon and stuff, and it has yeah. absolutely no false color in it because mirrors are perfectly achromatic. Right. It's only lens telescopes you have to worry about the chroma uh, right. error. Right. So that that's a fine scope. A friend of mine had one of those, and we used it a lot. It's fun. Yeah. It's and fun. And it'll show you the brightest, the brighter nebulas. And so. some of the double stars like uh, Alberio and uh, also uh, a miser and Alcor and you know because you know most people don't realize a lot of stars are doubles and, and you can stand up to use that one because the eyepiece is at the top of the tube right yeah so that's a nice scope too i do like it yeah four inches that's a hundred millimeters so it'll collect more light than the 80 millimeter but the yeah. 80, the 80 millimeter will show up nebula that are brighter because the reflector is f10 and the 80 millimeter scope is f7 i think f7.5 so it'll be about two or three times brighter in the extended objects like think like nebula and stuff the best that'll be neat yeah it's neat uh, any of those yeah. are good scopes to start with i think it'll be neat to tr i think it'll be neat too to be able to track it on the equatorial mount you know well that what's that what's that four and a half a quarter inch on that's an equatorial mount. This is here. Or is it that alt azimuth? Yeah. It's on this alt az. Okay. But but the 80 millimeter that you bought, it came on a alt az or equatorial mount? It came, it's the Orion one that comes on the equatorial mount. Hmm. I just Orion. got it for the kids though. You know, yeah, like I'm like, this I is think, perfect. You guys I can think that one is F5. Orion. 80 millimeter. Yeah. So that's quite a good fast system and it will show brighter faint objects. But when you go to the really bright objects, uh, planets or the moon, then you might see false color on it, which to a right. lot of people they don't care about. But eventually you'll get uh, you'll get used to it and you'll want to move on. Right. So you think are you, are you talking about this telescope right here? Compact no, refractor? Um, it's you want me to find it for you? Yeah, that'd be if great. You, um, let's see here. Let me go. You know how to share a screen? Yeah, let me go to minimize that so I can. Okay, so this is on. Mike, did you find that laser? Yeah. Okay. Bring that up later. Yeah. Hey, we have a pillow on. Oh, there's actually a person with the pillow. Okay. <laughs> I'm back. Dick looks like he's sleepy. Yeah. No, it's not just that. It's uh, it, the back I've got, uh severe spinal stenosis so this is my fetal position it seems to be the most comfortable for me so <laughs> so dick did you get heavy rain up there in paso robles oh yeah oh yeah i think it uh i looked at the rain totals on the uh for paso this morning and i think it was about 2.4 inches i think is what they got and that and it was still raining after that they usually compile those at seven or eight o'clock in, in the morning so we got a good one out of it so uh yeah it'll make up for all the wineries taking the water out of the, out of the ground 
Yeah, well, you know, I looked at the rainfall, at least for Paso, the averages were just, were pretty close to average rainfall uh, cumulative for this time of year. So we're doing pretty good. We're not doing too poorly. So. Yeah, Santa Barbara got close to three inches down low, but up to eight inches up higher in the mountains. Oh, oh my. We got about three at my place. Yeah. It's all, it's yeah, all still in the backyard. Oh, huh? wow. OERproject.com. Oh yeah, my kids were my kids were looking at the big history project today. So the, this is. guy, right? Like it's a good kids one. ADST. Wonder what the ST stands for. I don't know either. Maybe like I kind of was wondering if it was like standard or student. Or student. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so don't don't rattle it up and down. Just pause it right there so I can read oh. it. Thanks. F5, you're right. Richfield. Yeah, it includes an eyepiece and a, and a, um, a, a diagonal. So that's a good deal. And if you don't, uh, if you want to go up, scale a bit you can um you can put a different to telescope on that too so i was I, like i was like oh great an equatorial mount for kids you know yeah. like a kids go mm -hmm. yeah right yeah it's good doesn't tell um, me what st is but yeah and it, it's not you know it, it's not a, a fancy not a fancy scope but i'm like for that it'll be good for now you know yeah, I'm, I'm it's hoping. a good starter scope good I choice yeah i and i do i really like like making them have to use an equatorial mount to find things mm -hmm. by hand you know to, to yeah. start i think that's good and when they find it they can just track with it which will be nice mm -hmm. this one's a little harder to do that with they'll have to um, manually track with it right but at least it'll be only one yeah. thing for them to turn instead of two. Right. I think it'll be neat. And you can loosen the clutches on that and, and you can spin it to where you want to go. And then you fine tune with the with the knobs. Yeah. We've and got one of these. His, and they can practice their polar alignment too. Yeah. The uh it's got a red dot finder, which is pretty easy to use. Safer than a green laser. <laughs> I like using. Those are more advanced things she'll get into as she starts using it. Yeah. I think they'll like it though. I think they'll have fun. Yeah, I think you will too. You know. Mm -hmm. Hmm. <laughs> well, you've got eyepieces from the other telescope too that you I might do. be able to use. Yeah. So, yeah. What I don't see here is what what power is this scope being with the the eyepiece? What size? Oh, well, I mean, it says what, the eyepiece size in in there. I think. Oh, it's just a one point two five Kellner eyepiece. Okay, but it doesn't, it doesn't say. say the day the mill power. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't say what power, but there's. Yeah. She's got the other eyepieces that they can dial in the power they want it to be. Yeah, we bought them from you guys. Oh yeah. During one of the astrobaganza days that, that used to exist when pre-COVID. Yeah. Pre <laughs> Pre-COVID. How's how's your COVID lifestyle treating you? Well, that's up and down. Yeah. Uh, my 15 month old grandson got COVID. Oh, wow. oh. Um, back about Great. March or April. We never, we cannot figure out where he got it from because we all tested and we were all clean. And everybody was clean. And he just seemed like a very mild cold, but the test showed that he had COVID. So he didn't show any other symptoms. Just for a few days, he was real sleepy. And, but he got through it okay. My two neighbors came back from England about a month from now ago and they got, they both had it. 
And then two, two neighbors around the corner, a real estate agent and her podiatrist husband, they have it right now. So it's, it's definitely going around. Especially right now. It's really yeah. like this particular one's really contagious. I, I feel like hiding from everybody for the next like two months. You hide from everybody. <laughs> it's, it's... Wear, wear that mask consistently. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wash hands. It's, I think I'm going to go back to like ordering everything like to curbside, you know, curbside groceries, pick up, you know. I was excited for a while after I got vaccinated. I was like, I could go inside the grocery store again and feel safe. But I'm like, you feel weird when you go meet people in your family you haven't seen, you know. Yeah. Yeah. All I got to say is if they have, if it starts to look like, let's say, the rhino virus we're there's no way they're going to be able to produce a single vaccine nor will it be practical to vaccinate people because right. there's over 200 strains of the rhino virus right and the and the thing is is omicron this latest one they're saying it may have gotten some of its genetics from the rhino virus huh. even though even though covid is based on sars a version of sars yeah i didn't know about that with the rhino virus maybe it got yeah. some of it Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's oh, our common cold. That's interesting. That's a common cold right there. Every time you get a cold, it's a different rhino virus. Yeah. yeah. So the thing is, is to wash your hands and use a mask yep. and don't get on an airplane. You know, yeah, we're, we're definitely not going anywhere. You know, oh, I, I had a yeah. friend, I had a friend fly in from Singapore and they're so safe in Singapore. They follow all the rules. They wear masks. They have barcodes they scan in and scan out of every place they go so if somebody gets sick they can send you a message about oh you were exposed to this person at this grocery store they have a website where you can take photos of people who aren't wearing their mask or social distancing and like post it to the website and then the government can find them three hundred dollars like it's so different there that, that and then she, she flew in here and she's like oh my god i'm so scared heather and she was sending me all these pictures of people in the airport without their mask on i was like i told you it's terrifying here i would not get in the airport so yeah, yeah it's you know some off. of the things that we're doing like for example the mask wearing are things that we probably should have been doing before, at least at least in clinics and hospitals, because think of it, people are gonna go down there, they're sick. Gosh, right. I went in to have an MRI the other day and some guy came in there and he was hacking his brains off and he was gonna have an MRI, you know? Of course, they're asking him all these questions if he had COVID. Yeah, he had COVID before, but he doesn't have it now. Well, you know, you never know what the heck is going on. So they sent him home. But, you know, he was, he, everybody was wearing a mask. So I felt a lot safer that way. Yeah. 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 I know. So and the vaccines aren't supposed to really hold up that well against Omicron, right? Like it's like a 23% efficacy yeah. is what I'm hearing. Like, so. You know, it's one of those things that, that if they, if it starts to variate like, like the rhino, you we're just going to have to walk away. From a solution. Unless okay, it, it, says, it says that in the box is a 10 millimeter and a 25 millimeter Kellner eyepiece. So that's uh you get two eyepieces with it and you get a two X Barlow lens. Right? I think the kids will have a good time with it while I'm like looking for a real like nicer scope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why I'm not worried about them bumping it and messing with it. You know, this yeah. can be like their yeah. So it's They're an completely F, in control. It's an it. F5 scope, so it's very fast, 400 millimeters. So your 10 millimeter eyepiece will give you 40 power. Yeah. And so, uh, so in a month or two, you'll be able to see a ni nicely view the Orion Nebula. Yeah. Click on the video gallery. Do they have any? Has anybody done any astro stuff with it? You mean it just all? Yeah, I guess not. Okay. I thought I just was wondering if it had done anything. I know, right? It, no, it's yeah, no pictures or nothing. I did find a um I did find a, a guy who does a lot of sort of telescope videos. 
uh -huh. on YouTube. He's this little Asian guy, and he's clearly part of his local astronomy club. Um, and he has all of his um, opinions about the telescopes, and he'll even take pictures through the telescopes and show you the pictures he's taken for the different telescopes. Um, and he he did actually try taking pictures through this. He put it on his very, very fancy, like multi-thousand dollar tripod. <laughs> just for the heck of it, you know? <laughs> uh -huh. and, uh -huh. and then took pictures, th took pictures through this telescope and, and he did, he got some images, you know? He yeah. took a picture of the dumbbell nebula. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah. Huh. Good. I know. I was like, so you, possible. Yeah. Doesn't make sense really, to put it on a really expensive tripod, but you could. <laughs> no, it's a metal tripod. It'll it'll be adequate for that scope, but right. you're probably probably not going to get anything heavier, uh, significantly right. heavier on it. Just make so. sure that it's reasonably polar aligned, so that they only have to use one knob. To right. move it once that that's gonna be the that's gonna be the trick mm -hmm. that yeah, be the test. Was it. i don't see, i don't see where they could fit a polar alignment scope in there so you're gonna have to line it up by eyeball yeah right. you have to do some kind of drift alignment which is probably not gonna well, be super easy to do yeah, i don't think she's gonna they're gonna do that not, yeah not, it, it, but it looks it, like they won't have patience looks like you can set the altitude um, yeah, you could do you know, that. They get a rough amount. Yeah, you yeah, can and then them. then you can fix the tripod as to you have to move the tripod, rotate it a little bit to get it. You can use your you can use your phone, okay, because it's got an inclinometer and it's got a compass, right? And so you get it within a, a degree of where it's supposed to be, mm -hmm. um, and you're you're pretty much there. Um, at fairly low power, yeah. That this scope produces, it's it, the the alignment is not super critical. Mm -hmm. You just need to be within, you know, a few degrees, yeah. and it'll exactly. track. The trick with using your phone for a compass is that you got to be a little bit away from the, yeah. away from the telescope in case right. there's metal in the telescope, right? Because the, the the phone will think that's magnetic north where your telescope is. Oh. Okay. okay. There, there's there's another trick is that uh, some apps for your iPhone actually um, acts as digital setting circles, yeah. and as you point at different areas, it'll it'll tell you where it's pointing. Um, but that's for another day. Just to see how they get you know how they have a hang for it. So this is a scope that. Uh... We have for sale from the club. It's a ninety millimeter max oh, max Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a nice, amazing. nice little, nice little oh, one yeah. that fits on, fits on the Orion uh, mount like you have. We so or a camera tripod. Yeah, yeah. I had to figure it out. It was it wouldn't wouldn't focus properly. It turned out that the screws for the holder were getting too far in and it was blocking the movement of the primary mirror. Ah. I had to shorten I the screws it wrong. to make it work. Yeah, some of that got messed up. That's a common um, adjustment I have to make when I'm building a telescope: is filing the screw down to get just the right length on it. Yeah. Here, here, Tim Crawford made this binocular mount uh, so that someone could mount on. And this is a Ryan tripod uh, mount here, right here, the equatorial mount, and uh, he made this for Don French and. Don French got frustrated with it, so gave it back. So this is available as, as well. C kind of a neat way to uh, pick up a wide field in the sky and and be, look downwards. And, and so you're not craning your neck upwards, you're looking down and you can uh, set that up to track things in the sky. I think that's, that's really, cool. really clever. That is cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what else do we have? So here's the mount that we have to go with that. Oh, fine. So it could, could hold the C90. Like it's the same mount that you get on your Orion telescope. Same right. tripod. Right. Looks like it. Yeah, it looks identical. 
So I hadn't well, hadn't put this out to, to sell yet. It just hadn't gotten around to showing this to anybody. I think I, I might have shown it, but haven't gotten any interest in club members, but uh, need to put it on Craigslist, I guess. The C90 and this this mount. That's Tim great. didn't want Tim didn't want it back, but it's pretty clever. The binocular mount. It's fun. Did you make that? No, Tim Crawford, one of our okay. members. Which you've you've met before at our telescope work, telescope workshop. Really nice. Yeah. Well, Tim always has to make something. He just finished making a guitar from scratch. <laughs> yeah. And before that, he made teeth. <laughs> he made what? Teeth. Oh, is he a dentist? No, yeah. Oh, that's right. Yes, yes, yeah. He's he was, supplied yeah. us. If you got a crown technician. or something or a replacement here in town, you very much, you very likely got it from Tim. He's very skilled at that. Mm -hmm. I've so got Jake, something to share. There you go. Okay. I was just going to ask you. Okay. Let me see here. I'm trying to figure out where I want to go first here. I'm thinking here will be where I'll go first. Heart and soul, three panel mosaic. I just did this one. Um, <gasps> That's so, so pretty. Thank you. Um, oh, I love it. And so this is, um, I did processing. I, I did this with a NP 127 IS, the Teleview. Uh, and it's about 660 millimeter focal length with a 35 millimeter camera. It's a uh, Canon 6D MK3 is what I used. It takes about two nights to compile the data for each of the three panels that I put in this guy here. Now, what I did is, let me see if I can get this guy and show you how it was kind of put together okay here is i'll try to get it a little bigger for you these are the three panels so you can see this panel here is orientated uh with the with with the with the rec the black rectangle so that's the reference piece right there and this is the second panel right here, and this is the third. So when I put this together, there's this artifact that I've been telling you guys about. Heather, you don't know about it, but there's like a little band down here on the, and I still can't figure out what's causing it. And it seems to be something that has to do with the camera. Well, it's on this side, not on this side. So when I overlaid these panels, I overlaid them such that this is panel three, this is panel two, and this is panel one. So that's the overlay order. Okay, and that's important because what that does is that cancels out this area where you have this artifact that's down here at the bottom. Um, and so when I, I also do a linear fit because the backgrounds for each of these panels could be different. So when I did a linear fit, I, I fit panel two, this panel to this panel here. And then I put I fit panel three to panel two, so that all as you go across everything fit pretty well. This corresponds to about two degrees of field rotation per panel, and so what I settled up on to get everything in here it's really tight. I mean it was really hard to get everything, and the navigation wasn't quite as good as I would have liked. Oh, it's excellent. Oh, thank you. But I, I, I would like to get it a little tighter next time. But but I would use three degree field rotation. So the, that that gives a good compromise to end up getting everything in. So when I when I put it together, that's kind of what what happened right there. Um, let's see, get this guy out of the way. So this guy came out pretty good. It, there are some artifacts. We can't get around artifacts, it seems like, in this kind of thing right here. But, you know, it's reasonably good. And and uh, I like this area right here especially. Uh -huh. That came out pretty good right here. So, but you can see some artifacting here. There's some artifacting there. That's right on the seam of the panel. So you can't, 
I can't seem to get around it. I, I must say, I didn't play around with it very much. Um, I'm going to tell you this much right now, just to load this, to load this project takes about 15 minutes. So it's something to think about when you're putting these mosaics together is the, the time consuming nature of this. And as you add more panels in the mosaic, of course, it's going to take even longer and longer to do these sorts of things. Every all the support files, everything takes much. Hey, Dick, it was, what, what kind of computer are you, are you using? I'm using a uh, Asus laptop. It's got about 64 gig of RAM. Uh, it's got a couple terabyte drive, I think. Solid state and, drive. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's a uh, it's a it's a pretty good system. I mean, I, I bought the system primarily for doing just this, and my older system couldn't hack it. It's got a quad in it. Um, I think a lot of it is the way Windows is these days, uh, but uh, also these files are extremely large files. If you think about it, each of these panels is probably a hundred, probably I'm going to say on the order of hundred megs. So you're probably looking at a three or 400 megabyte file. Wow. So you start to do this stuff and, and it just takes up so much space and, and so forth that it really makes it difficult. Uh, to you know, it, and a time-consuming process to do any of the process. So, Dick, you're time. using the uh, Canon. Uh, what is it? 60D? Sixty D. Sixty. Sixty. Yeah, it's, Sixty. Full frame, full frame camera. It's a thirty-five millimeter camera. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Now, this image here, as far as the cropping, I didn't do a lot of cropping on the individual panels. Um, uh, but I did, do, you had kind of have to do a little bit because otherwise you're going to get artifacting just because the panels, the panel edges are too crappy. But I, I use the same precision techniques when I do these shots. Every frame of every panel is exactly in the same position. Okay, so you don't get any kind of distortions as a result of that and you get the maximum size panel that you can possibly get. But I still end up cropping just a little bit out of the image when I do it. So that's kind of what I've been working on right there. And uh, so you got your heart and soul. <laughs> heart and soul mosaic. It's so pretty. Thank you. So Dick, is, are you using the raw files, right? Yeah, those are raw, raw frames. Now, you notice that that particular project file takes about 15 minutes to load but the there's another project file to start this project file because first thing you got to do is you've got to take uh each of these panels and each of these panels has to be um uh let's see uh background neutralized okay and photometrically color calibrated before i even get to this point then you make a. Uh, Can you do all that? And picks, picks in sight? Does yeah, picks in sight yeah. use, does all everything's it? done there. Even the stacking is done in picks in sight. Mm -hmm. You have to make uh, an alignment template. Okay. And what that does is you take, you take one of your panels. Okay. And you use that as your reference panel. And then you say, okay. Now I want to take this other panel here and add it to that. Okay. And so what it does is it goes and does a star match in the overlapping Ooh. region. Okay. And if it finds, I think, I don't know, 500 stars or something like that, then everything is fine. And so then it aligns that, that panel to, to the other panel. Mm -hmm. Then you take that, the two together, and you make that your reference panel and so on. And you collect, collect all the panels together. That's Once great. you have an alignment template, then you make a file for each panel. And what that is, is it has just the panel itself and everything else black where all the other panels are. Okay. So you end up getting a, a, a file that has your little image and then three blanks the other two blank spaces for the other two panels. So each of the, so you have basically three, three 
uh, files. Then you put that into this merge mosaic. Uh, it's called gradient merge mosaic is what it is. You put those files in there and you really only have a couple of settings. You have something called a shrink radius, which is something that has to do with the stars. And you have something called feathering. And feathering is just a pixel by pixel way of, of making it so that it gradually feathers into the next panel. Okay. And so those are the only two criteria that you have to control over there. So it, it kind of puts you between a rock and a hard place. If you have a star, let's say, on the border of that panel, then you're, you can feather over. But what if you feather over to another star, see? And then you still have the same problem with the artifact. So I'm still working with it, you know, but it's very, very time consuming when you start to get more than one, uh, one image, uh, you know, when you start putting multiple images together and these guys are doing, you know, some of these things are, I don't know, 16 panels. So I'm thinking, gee, many Christmases, that must take you a long time to do something like that. Yeah, they probably are using like the a 24 core processor yeah and... a cray <laughs> it's just served oh. by a deck <laughs> no, no no our 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 iphones are more powerful than crazy used to be i think but uh they might be using a beowulf ring for parallel processing there you go let's just go to astro bin and give up doing your own stuff yeah there you go. <laughs> there's no glory in that <laughs> It's got yeah, if you, if you, if you want to feel one. small and insignificant, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm going to do that California Nebula next, and I'm going to do it with the same scope. And that's there a good right one, there. too, because I can orientate the long axis to the long axis of the California Nebula, see? And then we can find out whether that artifact is following the, the angle of the camera, or is it still going to be in the same place? See. So that that artifact is on the lower rim of every single subframe you take, right? Yep. Okay. Yep. It's some kind. Of, I I take it, Jerry. I'm going to take it as some kind of vignetting. Okay. So it, it's got to be some kind of vin, vignetting that's going on. I think it looks more like a double exposure to me. Well, maybe it is. It's like you've know. got a band of of light uh, being uh, received by the film or by the the FPA focal plane assembly okay. in addition to the stars. Right. So that, that would not be vignetting. It would be straight light. Okay. Well, we'll take a look at that. All right. This would make a nice poster here. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's the thing. I think now they have these nice flat screens are getting cheaper. You just put a flat screen in your wall and just kind of rotate through all these beautiful images. Right. Save it. I've got a 480 millimeter version of that guy, but uh, I wanted to get a little bit more magnification on it. 480 millimeter, what? It's a 480, it's actually an 80 millimeter uh, EDT. It's uh, apochromatic. It's the Orion 80 millimeter. Oh. The ED4, uh, AD80, ED something like that. Yeah. yeah. We were talking that about that. Guy. Hmm? We were talking about the ED80. What's that stand for, ED, Jerry? What's that stand for? Um, extra low dispersion or enhanced dispersion, depending on who you're talking to. Doesn't it have that extra lens behind the lens that brings uh, the light back? The one, well, they're all achromatics are like that. Though. What, you're, what you're looking at buying is a two element um, primary that's made out of ordinary optical glass, like BK7, and I forget what the flint element is, but it'll be a crown and a, and a flint element, which is which refers to the composition of the glass. And the um, uh, to get much better performance, you want to add a third element to make a triplet, a three element lens, and that will show no color um, to the human eye looking through it. You won't see any color. It'll be perfectly achromatic. But the third lens um, adds a lot of expense to it. It's uh, because they have to do more to align it. And the glass is made out of um, a, a different kind of glass. You can get, every now and then, you can get a two element lens that performs 
almost like a three element lens because it uses ED glass. And that's what the Orion 80 millimeter that you can't get anymore, that's what that one does. Okay. So, um, but I have a, a four inch, five inch diameter, uh, four element lens, which also Dick Beam has, which is the MP127. And that one is flawless in terms of uh, aberrations and color, but it's an $8,000 telescope. So it's not a beginner scope. Here, here's a, a small comparison shot there. 80 versus uh, probably an eight inch, could be bigger. On a go-to mount of some sort. Did you make that big? Yeah, I don't know if I get how big I can, if I go directly to cloudy nights, I might be able to find well, you can it. Do, uh, you can use the mouse wheel and hit the control. Hold the control. control control plus yeah i know yeah. just just don't know if i can open a new tab and then i can maybe you could double oh, click on the picture sometimes that does there it. You go. there you go yeah it's, it's not a very high resolution picture that's okay it's better yeah yeah that's the orion 80 ed it looks like next to a um celestron eight eight inch probably yeah yeah so that's the scope that Heather's got. Is that the, or is that something else? Well, she has a smaller version of this. Smaller yeah. version. Okay. A, a manually. Well, this does that's look a, like a manual. Oh, that's a manual. Yeah, that's yeah. it is. It is a lighter weight, lighter duty version of that mount. Yes. So the that's um the kids one that I got, version. it's it doesn't have. It's not the ED, unfortunately. It's no, just, it's right. Not. It's an ST, whatever that is. Yeah, yeah. I've never I, seen I think that the before. ST must mean student. <laughs> something. But it's cheap. It, it's fine. It'll, it'll do fine for uh, beginning work. And right? For a kid? If there's things that you find limiting in some way or another or frustrating, then that'll help you pick the next telescope so that right. that's a limited. Yeah, right. I think this, this mount actually they sell for like a hundred bucks. So. The yeah, scope right. is only yeah. pretty pretty good deal for sixty bucks. Getting the scope like that, yeah, really. And Dave. you get a moon map too. <laughs> yeah. I think they, I think they'll like it. I think they'll have fun. You know, uh -huh. I mean, you know, kids kids can figure out all sorts of things to do with stuff like that. Knock it over, set it back up. <laughs> <laughs> It is a little light, lightweight. If there's a way to uh, attach a heavy, what a, a gallon of water to the to the tripod to hold it down, that would be right. something. If you, I don't know if, how, if you can do that on that one. There's there is a there we go. There's a holder. There's a triangle holder plate down at the middle. Yeah. That's the one I got right there. Uh, nice, yeah. Ed eighty t, and and uh, that that's what, it's a good oh. scope. And then I use the. Uh, uh short tell short tube telescope or what do they call it the field flat matter for that guy right there yeah that. so that works out pretty well for me that looks nice yeah uh, let's see if i can show you something I did. and that's the one that you use to take all those beautiful pictures well that's just one of the scopes i you know actually i don't use that one that much anymore um i'm using more i'm more using the teleview that I showed you the the one that I, I showed you the picture of. So, well, Dick, right right now, Dick, aren't you just using your your Canon with uh, what lens are you using with your Canon for these big wide field shots? Oh, for the uh, the constellation views, you mean? Or, or oh, for yeah. heart heart and soul? What are you, what are you using a heart telescope? Heart and soul is the teleview. Oh, it was yeah. okay. That's the teleview right there. So. One twenty seven. Uh huh. So let me see. I'll show you what I did with the. Let me see if I can show you what I did with the. There you go. That's that's with the eighty. That's the with the eighty 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 that I just showed you. That the the Orion one. Wow. That's, that's California. That's so pretty. So what I want to try to do is 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 use the teleview because I think the teleview will just about capture the whole thing. It's, this is 480 millimeters, okay? So the teleview is 660. 
So it should, if I, if I rotate it, see, it yeah. won't be like with this right here, this is probably, uh, I'm going to say maybe north, south of the, the short axis. I'm not sure about that, but I think it is. And, and so um, I would just orientate it so the long axis is the long axis of the nebula. So it's not going to be north, south. It's going to be at an angle. And then we could find out if that artifact moves you know does it angle itself then or is it going to do something else so but yeah that that came out pretty good it, it's it's a good little scope um it, it does good good imaging and we're at quarter to nine right now anything else oh here's something i, oh, I gotta show you this this is uh a little globe here that I just couldn't resist. Seventeen dollars comes with a little ceramic finger stand that you put it on, and it has a, a touch button at the bottom. It turns on, then you can start seeing, which you can't right now, probably with all the light in here. Let me see if I go dark. Uh, oh, I've got a better way of doing this. Let's see. Was well, that the one that looks out. like the moon? Oh, it's a, I yeah, see. it's actually it's moon. And, they look cool. Yeah, and so if I go to where do I have it? right here? Now I'll share. I'll share what it's supposed to look like, and it does in, in a dark room. It looks. It looks kind of neat. You can actually see the moon surface. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, that's so cool. That is really cool. And, and uh, it, let's see if there, where's the video of it. Uh, yeah. Oh, I guess a different one had a video. But yeah, for seventeen bucks, I, I just couldn't resist. It was. Yeah, it, that's neat. If you hold the button that's down, so it'll get, go dimmer. It's you know, it's not perfect. You, you get a lot of uh, kind of stray lines and. Uh, Huh. and things in it but it's it's kind of kind of neat it's kind of close it'd be neat if it was just a little bit more refined but uh, mm -hmm. not bad for 17 bucks a little night light that you can you can tap on it and it'll go dimmer and if you tap it again it'll go kind of more of an orange color uh my and, daughter and so got me one of those oh cool and this is a small one this is like three and a half inches uh, they have other ones that are, uh, you know, four, four and a half and six inches. And I think even bigger ones, of course, they go up in price when you do that. But I thought I'd take a chance and see how this turned out. And some people say, you know, they go bad after a certain amount of time, the rechargeable battery inside. So you charge it for two hours, you'll get eight hours of, of light. How, from does it, it, how, does it, uh, how does it open up to change the battery? It does not. It does not look okay. like it's meant to open up at all. So how do you so recharge the battery? So by end up from from the from the little spot on the bottom that you plug into uh, right, right here yeah oh there's, there's a socket there huh? it's a port and a touch switch that's that's all it is okay so the ba battery's inside and but it's a nice even light it's kind of neat and it does you know it looks really plain but until you turn the light on in a darker area then then the craters oh, I, can see the, where, I can see where you've got to keep this out of the hands of werewolves <laughs> <laughs> yeah i might yeah instantly turn them on yeah do they yeah, do so they, do they do planets too they should do the planets they should Ooh. i you know i, I didn't yeah. look for for that uh, if they got some glowing planets they should have that somewhere i would think yeah but uh it's a pretty good neat. holiday gift for somebody you know yeah 17 bucks amazon yeah uh-huh well do you want me to show you the uh the laser that the uh... yeah yeah let's go to that okay let's just stop the share stop share just... and I'll do share screen I should have brushed my hair gosh <laughs> okay so they they have two lasers they've got the fifteen dollar cheapy and then they have the more expensive one. Um, which I can't find here. Where is it? It's sold out. No. He only sells that to people that call him up and complain. <laughs> no, no, they have it here somewhere. Oh. Let's see. There we go. Okay. Uh huh. So I, I got that in this one's tune. Um, 
So evidently he put on a low resistor thing on, on mine, but uh, um, so uh, right there is a little gizmo where you got the lens that you can, you know, fine tune it. Hmm. And uh, pretty fancy. Yeah. Um, but I would put a variable resistor on there so that you could, uh, you know, protect it a little bit. Well, well, Mike, on your original laser, was there a lens in front of that one? It's a plastic lens. If I go back to the other. So that, the other, that's probably where the distortion that two, two beams came from. It, it, the lens was, was bad. No, the, it came because of the transients on there. Um, the, the lens is right over there. Um, basically, the other, the other laser is this one where he takes the lens off and puts a, a quality lens on it. No, um, the transient um, lasers are very sensitive devices. And if you put a little extra voltage on there, they'll actually blow out the, you know, that they read they rely on two mirrors to bounce the light back to make it coherent. And it's easy to damage one or the other mm. um, faces of the laser. Um, so uh, that's probably what happened. But the, the electronics, that little thing right there is the same thing as on the other laser. Mm. It's just that they just, he takes it apart. He makes a precision assembly with a precision. Um, yeah, right there. See, that's the the cheapy laser. He takes the lens off and you put on a. And, uh, and he he three D printed that holder, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. He's the GR five store. He's he sells printers and um, uh, other things. He he does a lot of um modifications to these utility makers and a couple other press of um uh printers okay and so he just made it he belonged to the interferometry club and just came up with his 3d printed uh oh come on yeah, this here, the, the kit. Come on. It's not. No. This is all 3D printed. With hmm. Different plastics. And it's, it's got a couple metal parts, uh, some tube and tubing and other stuff that he sells as a kit. Okay. This is, this is what he doesn't make that he sells as part of the kit. You got the tubing that these rods slide in and um, actually the parts are much better than shown here. That's they're actually finished pretty well. Um, but uh, um, so is so, he an amateur astronomer making mirrors yeah, and things? Yeah. Okay. So what he does, he, he uh okay bring this up okay these are the parts that he prints up they're 3d printed okay and that's part of the um uh the assembly and you put those parts together and you come up with a three axis come on assembly here that's X, I mean, X, Y, and Z, because it needs to be uh, the, the, the actual interferometer, whoops, needs to be, um, where is it? Okay, here it is. This is the actual interferometer where in this point right here, you put in the, the light splitter this is where the laser is, and then there's a mirror, and it's all, uh, it, it's put on the three axes, uh, and that's that's the only thing that's kind of funky about it is 
you have to move this very carefully in order to get the interfer interferograms. So here's a sort of a drawing of it. So it's 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 kind of touchy, and uh, uh, I I have I have issues getting re, uh, repeatability as far as actually getting a, um, a a decent image. It takes a bit of uh, tweaking. What's this here? So, anyways. Oh, that's the same thing. So you haven't tested a mirror yet with the with the new I laser. Have. I have, but I uh, haven't gotten any really good results because of the old laser um, had a, a dark spot in the middle of it, and it was but with causing the new, the, with the new laser. You haven't tested anything. No, not yet. I just got the laser in. So okay. last night I was uh, goofing around, you know, getting things aligned and. Note, noting, hey, you know, you, you got this hot dog, but there's not there's no black streak in the middle. Mm -hmm. So uh, but it, it takes a little bit to to get it going. You have to have things exactly aligned. And uh, so uh, but once uh, once I get that down pat, you know, it should be easy to test a mirror to, you know, 20th wavelength or 50th wavelength accuracy. That's that's the promise of it. The, the the hard part is getting things set up really well. So I'm sure you'll get there. Yeah, it's just you know I I I got some images before. It's just a matter of getting it just right, and uh, there's there's videos showing how to do it. But but things are a little touchy, you know. If your tripod is not exactly um, steady enough, you'll get differences. So what I'm thinking about doing is getting my grinding my my telescope polishing stand. That is a real beast, and just mounting that on there instead of a a regular uh, regular tripod, and uh, get things really stable that way. Okay. Anyways, um, news on the next dome. I actually contacted, I called up next dome. They were going to send me some glue and some other stuff to fix it, but I heard other people have the same problem that I have. Now, this the was the air in your observatory wall, right? Yeah, and in, in, in the dome itself. The dome, yeah. The wheels. Absolutely, yeah. So, uh, one one fix is, and I was just finding out about it, is to put metal tape, tape yeah. on there to take the strain of it. And I guess uh, some people have used that to fix it. Um, I was hoping to talk to Bruce tonight because he has the thing about applying. The fiberglass, yeah. Well, fi he talks about melt welding the fiberglass to the uh, dome material that would yeah. be a much stronger way of doing it you, you know the only thing that that bothers me about that is the coefficient expansion is going to be different for the different materials so i'm thinking you know if you bond this stuff is it just going to eventually break apart because of the different expansion it could it could you know i was yeah. trying to find out what type of plastic is and um uh applying that but but what people have done is put this on the bottom side you know I, here's the broken piece okay and already started doing some of it okay, okay that that didn't come with it you did that okay i did that okay, okay. and that makes it much more rigid now the, the idea is how much material do i put on here do i put on one thickness two thickness or five thicknesses on there and so it makes it a lot rigid this this piece actually is broken it's got a big uh, tear on it uh, i don't know you, you sure. put the metal tape on both sides yeah i decided that i would do that and it's just smart is 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 to captivate you know because there's 
what you can't see here is a big gash and you know separation here right so the metal but, tape but, you, but it actually it. feels like it got stiffened by just that thin metal tape oh yeah is that yeah, the yeah. dome side or is that the station that um this is where the shutter comes down oh the shutter comes down yeah so right. and it's on the dome yeah okay right so this is the this is the dome right here and the wheels roll in this section okay right here the wheels are riding underneath okay and pushing and, and pushing, pushing and the thing. plastic is giving because Gravity, we needed yeah. the entire dome so um what i've been doing is researching i guess this is probably as good as i'm going to get um uh i was hoping for thicker uh a, a, a thicker um tape so i wouldn't have to put any this is like four mil, uh, four thousandths of an inch thick. And uh, I, that's about as thick as you can get a, around here. And this you can get from Home Depot or whatever. Yeah. So it's, you know, um, anyways, I got, I got lots to do. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I I'll think we've reached going. a nine o'clock time here. It's about time to close it up. So any final okay. comments? Okay, so it was nice seeing you guys and Heather and good luck with the telescopes and the kids. How old are the, how old are the kids? My oldest is 11 and the youngest is nine. Okay, perfect. Yeah. And my 11 year old is studying um, geometry and spherical geometry this year. Okay. Oh my gosh. He's already done like, basic triangle trig like the ta tangent cotangent sign just like the basic um, uh -huh. right triangle trig in fourth grade because we wanted to build a scaled model of the mission for the fourth grade assignment I was like you could do trig it's easy so um he just he just learned the basic stuff in fourth grade for that uh -huh. um and he already knew how to do like basic algebra for that um so uh -huh. then we're just Heather we're just Heather are you homeschooling yeah we have to because they don't really support this kind of education in, in the brick and mortar schools. Um, so in order to get like good content, it, it it's like the only, it's the only option um, that I found that works. But we, we started full-time homeschooling during the pandemic, like everyone else. And we're just like, this is so much better. <laughs> we should have just been doing this the whole time. <laughs> So, I mean, they definitely have like trashed my house and are fighting with each other a lot, but, um, you no, know. It would be fighting <laughs> other kids. Yeah, work. they'd be fighting the kids in the playground. Yeah, you, you, you don't <laughs> want to have to meet those other parents. A, no. friend of mine, a friend of mine claims that the first word spoken by a child that has an older sibling is Al. <laughs> <laughs> Or, I know or I vice versa. Her, I was yeah. like, you better watch out because she's fierce. You know, you, you taught her some things you might not have wanted to teach her. And now she's going after him. So <laughs> you know, what goes around comes around. You gotta be careful. Yeah, that's what I told him. I was like, she learned it somewhere. <laughs> Wasn't well, me. A, yeah. Well, well, it takes a special some someone to be able to sit down and teach kids on their own, you know, uh, kudos to you. Uh, yeah, a lot of parents didn't do that. A lot of, you know, no. a lot of them couldn't, you know, yeah, a, lot a lot of them were trying to hard. work, you know, full time, two adults working full time from home yeah. while their kids were. You're fortunate. Zoom yeah. school that wasn't going well. And, mm -hmm. you know, we're lucky we can do it. It's good. My husband's yeah. still working in this office from home. He works. He works for Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, for what? So he, he works for Fish and Wildlife Service. He does endangered species work. Oh. Um, and they still have the. They still have everybody working from home. So he has us in the background, which is fun for him. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right, folks. Okay, Good night we'll see for you. now. <laughs> and we're it, uh, on winter solstice next week says winter solstice tuesday yeah. oh yes yeah another holiday shortest Happy day of the year you guys bye good night bye. all good night